Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to our second installment of the Remo3 podcast. Um, I'm Samit Halvadia, I'll be hosting, and uh, today we are very lucky to have the godfather of group policy, Jeremy Moskowitz, join us for uh, a, a little session around what I like to call the evolution of app delivery. So welcome, Jeremy. This is good. I look. I, I think you, you guys have a very professional setup. Look at that microphone that Sage has. That thing is bananas. You can tell this is a class operation. Yes. This is cool. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, I just, I just got off the plane coming back home from EUC Masters. So I'm re- raring to talk about this topic because, like, this is the topic that never dies. This is yeah. like, you know, I, I, what I like to say is that you know Windows likes to run apps. Uh, and that's its job, right? We don't mm-hmm. care about Windows. We care about running apps, and Windows is the vehicle for that. So, yeah, so this is a great topic. I think we've picked a good one, and I'm happy to have some have some quality time and some fun. So that's great, and I'm really looking forward to this, Jeremy, because we've, we've chatted a bunch, right? But what's really interesting to me is the fact that you know, one of the things I like to do, like with Patrick in the last one, he's my nerdy James Bond. How how did you get this nickname as the Godfather of Group Policy? Where I mean, did you give that to yourself? Because that no no epic. no that that would be bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it just it look I, I I'm I remember I I think I was on stage at a at a Microsoft Tech Ed event or something, and someone was like, uh, "Hey, I've got a question for the Godfather of Group Policy." You know, some <laughs> some question. So it was something like that, and I was like. Wow, that like it like encapsulates it perfectly. I mean, I, it's like you know the Chick Fil A f- slogan is "We didn't invent the chicken; we invented the chicken sandwich." You know that kind of thing, and <laughs> yeah. that's how I feel about group policy. I didn't invent group policy; I invented the group policy sandwich, right? Yeah. And what does that mean? <laughs> uh, you know, for me, it's like I'm honored. I really am. I, every day, I'm just completely honored that anybody cares at all about what I have to say or talk about or speak about or whatever. And it started off with you know writing. I have a you know, I have a blog, GPAnswers.com, which is now called MDM and GPAnswers.com to encapsulate a lot of the new stuff. Um, I wrote the big fat group policy book. It's up there somewhere on there we go right there I yeah, see there it. It I about, see yeah <laughs> and uh, you know it's got it's gone through six major editions it's about 900 pages and you know it's just I, I fell in love with group policy because it was it was the thing when everyone was thinking about NT domains and how to get to active directory they were all everyone was like in a all in a twist about how do we get there I knew we were gonna get there and once we were gonna get there what was interesting about it Group policy was the thing for me. I was just like, oh, once we get there, we have all this management, this baked-in management to the uh, to what we have for these on-prem domain joint machines. And I just thought that that was the bee's knees, just like being able to, to, you know, before, in order to do that, in order to have any kind of management for Microsoft, that was S- SMS, okay, yeah. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 2.0, whatever. And, you know, you needed servers and SQL and databases and expertise and understand every freaking log file. And even then it didn't work. And I just love that group policy right out of the gate. I mean, it's just like, it worked. Wait, 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 where's the magic fairy dust? It just works. So anyway, long story short, I mean, I fell in love with it. It fell in love with me. And then, you know, be, you know being able to create things like the blog, like the book, and then eventually things like Policy Pack that – got its start initially filling the holes uh, uh, in the road toward getting people successful in group policy. It's taken on a different, you know, slightly different life now with MDM things, but it's still really well known for being able to fill in these gaps in group policy. So all said and done to put a button on it, you know, being called occasionally the godfather group policy is a humongous <laughs> honor for me. Uh, but it is because, you know, I, I didn't invent group policy. I invented the group policy sandwich. So there you go. I love that. I'm going to start using that. You know, I didn't inv- <laughs> I didn't invent application management. I invented the application management sandwich. It's so There you good. go. Isn't that great? <laughs> I mean, but like think about this, right? You you just brought up SMS 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3. Like I remember the days of SMS and like yeah. the original gangster of like uh, uh, yeah. ESD. I, I think – did you ever call it ESD? Because I think at the very beginning it was electronic software delivery for I these just, IT admins. I just remember – okay, I, I got my uh, – uh, I'm so old now. Um, I was one of the first MCSEs ever and the way that it worked is that you had like four initial uh, exams you had to pass and then two okay. electives, okay? So my electives – my electives were Microsoft Mail, not Exchange, Microsoft Ooh. Mail, and SMS 1.0. <laughs> 
That is amazing. And I mean, yeah. but the, the, it, it's so funny because I, I, I look at that and I think about, gosh, you know, it, it was really easy, relatively speaking, to deliver applications when you were just delivering them one way, right? You're oh, yeah. taking it from SMS is managing the delivery of this application to your Windows device. End of story. That's it, right? Like, well, it if, was if physical. it worked, let's, let's start yeah, with if that. It if it worked, okay. yeah, okay. Uh, and, but then there's then there's always, you know, the the price performance ratio of like pre baking it into your image. Uh, like on the one hand, like oh, Office, it's amazing. You just bake it in. It's 400 gigabytes. That sounds great. But then there's a whole lot of downside to like pre installing apps because if you pre install an app and an Office may be an exception, let's just take that one out of it. It's called Dog Food Maker Pro, okay? Sure. It's a fake fake app that I've been using for forever. Dog Food Maker Pro. You pre install Dog Food Maker Pro into your into your machine and now you've what I call you're in a disconnected state, right? You've pre installed this thing and then you wanna then you want to do an upgrade. Gosh, how are you gonna do it? The you you didn't do it in a managed state, so you have really no way to get out of it. Are you gonna what are you gonna do? You're gonna write a script? You're gonna Walk over to each machine. You're gonna go to a USB stick. It's terrible. So there, there, there is a big downside. If you pay a pe- you pay an upside. There's a you know a, 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 a free free money cost of being able to pre-install it on the machine. But then the toll later is the worst toll of trying to like keep it upgraded and, and up to up to date all the time. Well, I mean that that that's how you get win rot, right? Like, I mean, when you have these images with pre baked applications that are just mm-hmm. degrading over time because people update like. The group policies. They'll update the cumulative updates. They'll update the patches on these images. What they're not necessarily doing is understanding the impact that you already have of stuff that's already pre-baked into that image. And that's where the degradation happens. I don't know. I mean, if, if, if that's what you've seen, but in my opinion, that's where we're sitting. It, there's a lot there's the, the, applications are there's so many types of applications now between like those uh, I can't remember what the heck they're called the one that like t- teams is made out of uh, I can't you know one type of app I can't remember what it's called uh, whatever oh is it it's, um, Electron yeah thank you I was thinking Spark I couldn't come up with it good job yeah. Sage you get the gold star man you know <laughs> I love yeah, it so, Sage Sa- Sage is a, so you know there's an Electron apps there's you know Win32 apps there's UWP apps there's you know apps that are being slung from over there that aren't really apps. There's like all sorts of things. And then there's also this idea of being, you know, self-updating apps. Mm-hmm. So it, man alive, if only there was one amazing quick way to just like install, that would be incredible, but there's not. And, and there's also new style stuff that's coming out the door too, right? So I'm sure you've heard of this, of the idea of like Winget and Chocolatey and yeah. all these things. Well, what, what, why don't we take a step back and kind of define what that what that is for for everybody so you know microsoft wants to have a kind of unif you know this this challenge of applications coming from all angles meteors just falling from the sky at different angles instead wouldn't it be great to like sort of have maybe a kind of a more unified way and that's a pretty lofty goal but look they got to land on the they got to land the ship somewhere and they've landed on this idea called winget and winget is going to be uh maybe a scriptable method or maybe a uh, an API method where you can dictate applications that are either part of the Windows Store or part of a repository. Uh, so right. a repository can be a public or a, and also a private repository. Oh, what does this mean? Okay, so the idea is that well, in the store apps, we know what those are. You want to do you want to deliver Netflix and you want to deliver Pandora. I don't know why you want to. You could do that. Um, <laughs> you want to deliver uh, you know Seven Zip. That's maybe prepackaged by somebody who does that uh, through this uh, through this Microsoft repository or hey you've got your own dog food maker pro and that's never going to be out on the public internet somewhere right. some your your own customized app and you can point it toward your your repository okay so now we're sort of getting into some kind of reasonable way of getting of getting it delivered and I, I think they're on the right track um, there's also this uh, pre-competitor, which is this thing called Chocolatey. It's very, very popular. Lots of people use it. Um, you know, it's a community-based open source thing that has thousands of packages already. I, I, honestly, I'm not sophisticated enough to know exactly what the differences and the details are between the two. I'm sure Chocolatey is like light years ahead for now. And who knows, maybe WinGet will eventually or maybe not eventually catch up. You know, that's, that's typically how those things work. Well, the interesting thing about both of those stores, right, the concept is like, hey, we're going to try to make it 
easy to get applications and workloads that you need to do your job onto your desktop. Right. You know, like that, I mean, it, it's the first kind of self-service. I, I remember the first time Citrix came out with Storefront. You remember that, Jeremy? Yeah, Where sure, it's yeah. It's like, you know, like you see it and you're like, I don't, I don't know how my application is being delivered to me. Is it on a server and it's a screen scrape of server-based compute with Zen app running in the back end? Or is it a Zen desktop that I have a locally installed VM with an application installed on it? Like we're starting to see that complexity happen, especially with like Windows 365 and uh, AVD coming along. So like these stores are extremely helpful for a lot of these commercial off-the-shelf applications or mm -hmm. COTS applications. But like Dog Food Maker Pro and stuff like that, People need to have a more effective way. Like, I mean, t t take an insurance company that's built in, a, th that's running a claims uh, processing engine application on the back of a 2000, server 2008 box sitting in Ohio. With access in right? front of it. And I, exactly. I you want to, I swear this story is true. I swear yeah. this story is true. I was uh, giving it, I was giving, this is like not more than three or four years ago. I don't know, maybe yeah. three years ago. I was in the middle of, uh, I was at a, a, a big company that you've heard of, it doesn't matter, with funny commercials on TV, okay? So okay. Some, something you've heard of, okay? It doesn't matter who it is. And I think I know. Middle, <laughs> no, you can't know. You can't know. So I, I mean, and I, I'm, uh, lots of companies have funny commercials on TV. Anyway, the point is I'm, at, I'm there, I'm teaching a group policy class for these guys. I think this is my second one for them. And somebody bursts in the door in the middle of teaching, says, sorry, sorry, hey, sorry, um, we, we kind of have a little emergency. We're having trouble getting payroll to run, something like that. It was payroll or something very important like that. And, uh, uh, and we, need, we need making this guy up, Jacob, to come on out and help us out. Yeah. Uh, what, Jacob's like, what, what, why? What's going on? They're like, our Paradox database is not working. And I, I, I'm like, wait, are you talking about Paradox from Borland from like 1997? <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, we still run it on that. And the database, and when we hit F2, it actually doesn't compile right. I'm like, oh, my God, I used to consult in that. They're like, great, do you want to help? I'm like, absolutely not. I'm not putting my hands anywhere near that keyboard. That is not something I am going to, just because I touched it, you know, 100 billion years ago. The point is, that is an application that yep. drives a very important part of the business that was never converted. And this is way more common than... Um, you would guess it just yeah. it, they are out there so applications come in all sorts of forms you were just saying oh it was sql backend i'm thinking access and this reminded me of that that funny paradox story because i loved i loved paradox it was my it was my first my first i swear this is also true my first real it job i mean i had some working in the computer shop jobs before yeah but my sure. first real it job for real was right before i went off to college I was one of the last employees slash interns for Pan Am World Airways <laughs> before they went under. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's just like they were going under, but they still needed a summer intern. I'm like, sign me up. And I, my job, my that summer job was to write Paradox databases and like help them do some inventory, something or other. And I just fell in love with that. I just thought it was, the, I thought it was great. And I did, I did lots of Paradox work after that so <laughs> maybe i could have helped them but I, it would have taken me a while but i was in the no chance class why, no way yeah right? exactly <laughs> why do you want that on your hands right like i mean ultimately and, and think about this jeremy right with the evolution of the way people are delivering and consuming applications right not just delivering but also consuming them right i, I do so much more work on my phone now than i did you know three even three years ago or five years ago i wonder how i know so, that's true I went to uh, – yesterday I had a Southwest ticket and uh, uh, two years ago I would have had to go to the computer or call the people up, blah, right. blah, blah. I was able to yesterday on the Southwest app – I'm just giving them a – this happens to be the airline that is like in my near my house. Not sponsored. Yesterday – What's that? Not sponsored. Not sponsored. I just happen to really like them. I think they could give me first class seats, that would be amazing, but that's not a thing there. So uh, I was able to on the phone just – change change my flight bing bang boom and it just I did it all in points and it gave me a credit my credit back not they didn't like cost me any points I gave me a credit back because I picked a, a crappier flight and I was able to do that and then I got home my, my wife and I are gonna are gonna do a trip soon she had booked it and she's like oh my god I did it a day wrong boop 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 phone done and yeah. I went to bed yeah it's incredible it, it really is. And, and you know, it, of course there's a database there. I mean, of course there's an app there. It's not yeah. a Windows app, 
but the world, you know, the world is, uh, it's a, it is a hybrid, 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 hybrid world, right? We've still got the businesses, I, but I bet somebody in Southwest is using that access database somewhere to do something. Uh, There's something happening on the back end there, Jeremy. I can promise you that. Like, yeah. Can you imagine that, that that company you were consulting for, right? Yeah. Can you imagine if they're like, hey, can we move this application you know, into this paradox back end into AVD or to a modern workspace. Oh. I mean, you know, mind blown. That is not happening. Yeah. You know, newsflash, yeah. you're going to be stuck in this on-prem world for certain parts of your business in perpetuity. Like people that are thinking that this is going to be a forklift and everything is going to go to the cloud or everything's going to be DAS or everything's going to be persistent versus pooled. That's not happening. No, and the amount, I mean, I, I, I have a hard time, you know, Policy Pack is a 35 person company and Networks is a 500 person something company. And yeah. I have a hard time wrapping my head around when I hear statistics like insurance company ABC has 11,000 apps. Okay. And I'm like, 11,000 apps? Like, <laughs> what? Like, I, I do have a hard time wrapping my head around it, but the statistics are true. Um, you know, I, just because I don't use 11,000 things doesn't mean, but even then, for this podcast, I had to install something, and that's yeah. that's my 29th app or whatever. That's an app. <laughs> how, how did I get installed? I knew what I'm doing, so uh, I installed it. But if, if I was uh, the marketing person at Company ABC and I need to do a podcast and I don't know how to do this thing, I, I'm going to need somebody to hold my hand and help me. I'm going to be, I have to be a marketing expert. I shouldn't have to be an app expert. I right. thought you were just taking a shot at marketing because Sage is in here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't listen. Just put your ears. Just, just do one of I those heard things. nothing. Okay. I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 you're so right, Jeremy. I mean, like the, the the fact that you know you have to be kind of a subject matter expert, or you know you have to be somewhat tech savvy to be able to do some of these things. I, I mean, the majority. So Remo, we're we're growing obviously on a daily basis, but I still consider us uh, in the startup phase, right? So sure. you know we natively have the majority of our applications uh, as SaaS applications, but now like with voice recorder with some of these other apps you're talking about but like i looked at this whiteboard software that we use and i absolutely love it so shout out to miro um which is an amazing piece of software that you can actually use in no, the that's, browser that's just... remo mixed up if you say miro and remo it's, i think you guys should have a merger <laughs> i think we should i think it's really a good idea but uh, i did not even realize that till you just said that that's kind of amazing maybe that's why i like it so much yeah um but sorry like, i didn't mean to derail you <laughs> but we start uh, so the SaaS offering is great. It looks good in the browser, but then there's something to be said for when you install it and have the client. The actual Windows app. app. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. I mean, look, it's high, the high, right. I mean, when it, even like, um, I hate Facebook. I'm like sort of anti-Facebook in terms of like yeah. my use on it. I don't care about the political whatever. I just like, I'm not a big Facebook dude, but yeah. like some parts of my life for better, for worse have to run on it. I would rather use a Facebook app then I would use the Facebook browser. Browser. There's something about a high fidelity app. If it's on the phone, if it's the Windows app, yes. if, whatever. There's something magical about a high fidelity app. And, and even the Southwest example that we just did 10 seconds ago, mm -hmm. I used the Southwest app. I don't think I would have gotten bing, bang, bing if I wasn't um, you know, on the app. I think it would have like been either more cumbersome, non-accessible, mm -hmm. or some other challenge. But th 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 I agree. There's something magical about high fidelity apps that 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 do the actual do the work. And I think this this is why I you know this I, I, you, know, you put this all in a blender, and it, you can actually have one output, which is like this is why the world still runs on Windows. Yeah. Okay. The uh, Chromebooks they're great. Don't get me wrong. I love a Chromebook because you can take it, smash into a thousand bits, and it's only a hundred dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great for students who have low fidelity needs and some high fidelity-ish things that run in browsers. But sure. for, for apps like Windows apps and video editing, I'm sure somebody's going to say, like, Jeremy, you don't know what you're talking about. There's a killer video editing app in, in Chromebook I have yet land. to find I, it. <laughs> I'm sure there is. Let's pretend that there is. I, I, I'm sure there is. I just don't know it. But for me, I'm constantly editing videos. I'm, I'm doing simulations. So I need, like, a VMware. I need a Camtasia. I need, like, these high-fidelity apps that, do, that, that really need real Windows to do it. And I think that that's... That's why the world runs on Windows still, as opposed to these 
medium or low fidelity Chromebooks. And again, I'm not knocking Chromebooks. I think they're freaking great that for what they provide. The price performance ratio and the amount of stuff you can get out of it, holy mackerel. And I think I think iPads are like this middle fidelity thing. Yeah. You can get, um, you, you know, you you my you know kids. I, I saw this baby at the airport with just a phone. A baby which just poke just doing mm -hmm. her thing man yeah it, there's something to be said about ease of use on that but when it comes to real business real business still runs on windows and i think it's because of these high fidelity apps that are like the whiteboard like a camtasia like this video rec voice recorder thing we're doing here you know all these things that actually you know get teams you know all these things that that get the job done each you know, teams is a reasonable example of something that is medium or low fidelity on uh, on a web browser and it's very high fidelity when it's in in a real app no matter yeah. what that app is so anyway. well i'd say the whole this is the same thing for like so my, my daughter has a chromebook right and she's nine years old she's really pretty tech savvy she knows her way around it but like if i'm downstairs and i just i don't need to create content i'm just consuming content or oh yeah I'm, man like, that's how i, I do I, it i pop open the chromebook you open mm -hmm. the, i mean there's a teams app on the chromebook right where it's really yeah. just kind of office 365 sure so i'm great at reading emails on there or responding to teams messages but if i need to do something a little bit hardier like i need to create a new word doc or i need to attach an email or find an attachment on OneDrive, like okay at that point i i need to go back to the high fidelity windows experience that's it. Uh, more so than um it, yeah so i wouldn't want to be editing a, i wouldn't want to be editing a legal document with right. markup on an iPad, and yeah. uh, th that's a, that's an exercise in frustration. You know, yeah. I, 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 this is not my analogy yet, so I'm completely stealing this from somebody okay. else. Good, but like you know, uh, you remember, you're the Swiffer. You're the Swiffer yeah. is okay. Yeah. So the iPad is the Swiffer of the computing world. Oh, you have one. All right. So well, what does that mean? It means like, well, you use a mop for hot, for hardcore things and you use like a little dust bin for low, mm -hmm. low things. The iPad fit right into the Swiffer category yeah. of this middle thing we didn't even know we needed. And that's exactly what a Sw I have a Swiffer. I didn't know I needed one. It came out. I was like, holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Same idea. But it, it doesn't replace my mm -hmm. mop for hardcore tasks. Yeah. Um, you know, and. Swiffer has its own attachments and apps and so on, and so does an iPad. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's not the perfect analogy, but I really like that one because it's like, oh, it fit this thing, this middle, this middle thing between my phone for low tasks, or <clears throat> and you know, um, you, you know, my computer for high tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and for, for both of you guys, oh, sorry. Ahead, and, and your experiences, we're, we we we've, we've been touching on a lot of these different things, and we started with one way to do, to deploy applications, and then that became more complicated. Where do you see this going in the next, uh, I don't know, one to three years of we're getting more uh, platforms, we're getting more of these different specific use cases. Like you said, you're using the iPad for this thing. I've got a $3,000 PC I built for my video editing and working with 8K files and all this stuff. I'm not going to do that in the cloud. Where do you see these shifts going with AVD and these different ways to deploy applications? Why don't you so go Sage. first, Amit? Yeah, so Sage, why wouldn't you do that in the cloud, out of curiosity, right? If you get enough compute in a virtual machine that you sit, stand up in Windows 365 or cloud PC, I, I think that that actually as a use case where you don't have to spend the 3K on the hardware up front, but you spend, spend it for that. He can spend 3K for, in 20 minutes. Now, that's if, the if problem. You're not yeah, that's if you're not the problem, careful, right? If you're not careful. Yeah. It's like data so, lakes. okay, I, I, so keep this a secret. Don't we won't get we won't we won't tell the podcast listeners this <laughs> this secret about about Azure. Okay, this is a secret between just us, right? Uh, which is if you imagine you went on a ski trip, okay, and you left your shower running or your water running sink running, and you came back. Now, you didn't have a flood or anything. You just you just left the water running for a while. You'd come back to a a four dollar extra water bill, okay, yeah. from your ski trip. You do that on Azure, <laughs> and you you just turn around and you're like, oh, here's my car. <laughs> just you have to like, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, and until you know, the, look, everything in the world uh, if that's a commodity is an eventual race to the bottom for pricing. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. it's not now, right now. Like right now, it's freaking expensive. If you've got um, 
not 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 WVD specifically or AVD uh, specifically the um, but you know well if you you know if you depending on the configurations you use for these virtual desktops if you leave them on hot and cold running twenty four seven you will turn around to Sage's three thousand dollars in no time uh -huh. yeah. so that's why these things have this automatic you know shut down mm -hmm. and take twenty Deep seconds provision. to start it up yeah. yeah. Better for worse, as it sits right now, the IT guy gal, slash gal has to be in charge of that. And I think that's kind of not a great place right now for this. At some point, it either has to be like 10x automated, okay? Like like Microsoft just has to handle that or your cloud provider of choice, Amazon or whatever, mm -hmm. just has to handle that. Um, yeah. or, or it has to be so cheap that when you go on the ski trip and you leave your water running for the week, you don't come back to a $3,000 or whatever do dollar amount bill. Yeah. And we're just not there yet. So I, I think, agree. Samit, that's where, you know, I'm, not, I'm not speaking for Sage, but I, my guess is that it, maybe it makes sense to have a, a real machine that's beefy and does this thing and has, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I just, bought, I just bought one of those NAS devices that stores all my pictures and all my files. You might yeah. think, what? why, would, it, why uh -huh. would Jeremy do that in 2022 when there's all these cloud services? Because it costs me money every month yeah. to have passed this amount. Disk space, it has been a great race to the bottom, mm -hmm. but at some scale, it's not free anymore. I, yep. I, I can't remember if a uh, OneDrive is two gig or four gig, whatever, or Dropbox is this much or that much or whatever. At some, I have more movies and files than that. I don't want yeah. to put them in the cloud, even if I could, because it's going to cost me too much tacos. So the price-performance ratio for having some on-prem infrastructure, infrastructure in lowercase i, Sage with his computer and me with my crappy NAS device that's here in my house, well, it's the price-performance ratio we're willing mm -hmm. to pay for. When it becomes a race to the bottom and it's like hot and cold running disk and compute and it just doesn't matter anymore, I think Sage can just say like, oh, and bandwidth too, Yep. When he can get rid of, when he just eliminates all that, he can yep. build the machine of his dreams in the cloud and it not matter. So, so that's, that's a great point, Jeremy. So like uh, to that, like that, that the price performance ratio is what's going to dictate basically everything. Like you just talked about storage specifically in the cloud versus locally on a NAS device sitting in your closet, right? Like when you start thinking about it from that perspective, that's going to be the same thing for Windows, right? At some point, there's going to be that price performance where you think some of these applications are going to run great in Windows 365. Some of them I'm just going to have to have locally installed on my machine so I can use them the way that I want to touch and feel these applications, right? And I think that that, and as that race to the bottom and the price starts going down, we're going to start seeing more and more workloads theoretically move to a, uh, a medium fidelity experience as you call it and then you know you can still keep your high fidelity experience for the stuff that's local so i think you know sage to answer your initial question application delivery in the next one to three years is going to be exactly how jeremy just described storage right it was very much around the fact that hey my price performance ratio dictates that for me i have a lot of files i have a lot of data and i don't want to pay a monthly subscription of 9.99 to icloud for two terabytes but I will pay a one-time fee of, you know, $150 to store 10 terabytes in perpetuity. Um, that's still accessible from your devices. Yeah, I feel bad for these guys that put all this time, money, and effort into these on-prem storage-heavy uh, VDI worlds. I think that those guys are looking at the racks of servers that they have that are on-prem and just are like, oh yeah. man, maybe we shouldn't have. Um, because it's close to being the right price performance ratio to have some people have mm -hmm. virtual machines that are rented for so you know and that that the, the you know the storage that you have to keep yourself upgraded and you got to get another half rack and then oh yeah. get the full rack so i think these guys are starting to look at that and be like oh man maybe we got to we should sell that and just call it a loss uh, and besides you know i i don't consider myself to be an accounting whiz by any measure but my understanding is that you know if you buy a piece of equipment it's uh you know on your books one way and if you rent time at a computer it's a different way and yeah Hey, the, you know that that that's that stuff matters to some people sometimes. It does. And I think, and and you know, and if you have a 
I'm making it up, 100 people who have low and medium fidelity apps and they don't need laptops anymore. Uh, great, you could have built a Citrixy thing, you could have built a big ass VDI thing, or maybe you could use uh, an Amazon or a Microsoft thing. Like there are, there are these other options to get your basic things going. On the other hand, if somebody does have some high fidelity thing that they need to get to, like a Camtasia or editing something, maybe they're a candidate for two things. So uh, like yeah. you have a big, big ass laptop that does the thing and plus a connection into VDI, uh, into you know, remote Windows land. Um, so, you know, it is the right tool for the right job. And it is an interesting time. I mean, you know, Microsoft did, um, was it was clear, like they were just not interested in this for a while. Oh, it's the most important thing ever. Like they did like, boom, they flipped really quick on it. Um, as as they as they will do on lots of topics where it's just like, you know, they, they see that it's time time to own a spiral arm of the galaxy. Let's get spun up there and start doing that. Well, I mean, think about that, right? Like, I mean, the fact that the CEO tweeted that this is a top, you know, Windows 365 is a top initiative for, or a top focus for someone like Microsoft just shows how important, you know, desktop and application and workspace in general delivery is to their future hybrid of work, right? Well, like, I mean, all the stuff you're seeing around Windows 11 and cloud PC or Windows 365 with the four finger swipe uh, from local to cloud to boot directly to cloud PC yeah. from BIOS. Like that's clearly a statement. That's a line in the sand that says, guys, this is, this is coming. And we understand hybrid is the way forward. Yeah. But it, you know, in fairness, again, it does do something for, it's a two, it's a, it's actually a, a win-win for Microsoft from a business perspective, sure. uh, which is to say like, you know, everything that drives Azure consumption is great for Microsoft. Everybody knows that it's not a secret. It's not a dirty word. This is all, everybody knows everything that drives Azure consumption is going to be better for Microsoft. Uh, and uh, if they can get these, if they can get medium fidelity uh, devices to kind of be pseudo upgraded to medium high with Azure Virtual Desktop, or yeah. what we saw in the recent announcement with uh, Windows 11, where you can click a thing and, oh my gosh, your, mm -hmm. your Windows PC is like, from the cloud is like just a part of your desktop that becomes yeah. like a, a high fidelity experience. It's a win-win. So yeah. it is, I agree that they are, that, that, that they are keeping their eye on the prize and trying to make it such that, um, uh, that, that there's a little something for everybody, but it's got, you know, you, it's not, it's not a, it's not a mistake that why, why it's that important. It, the, it's right. obvious that it, it's, um, you know, w windows on the desktop has a place, but also windows in the cloud has a double place in Microsoft's heart because that's, what's going to drive more Azure consumption. Again, don't leave that tap water running. Cause that's where you're going to get barbecue. That's where so. you get paid. Yeah. <laughs> that's where you got to pay. But you know, it's, it's interesting because look, look, look at the next generation of uh, end users, right? Like back in the SMS days, someone would provision a lap. Some, someone would b buy a laptop in it. They would, put your gold image on there. They would put your applications on there and then they would ship it to your house. Like that's your day one experience. Now, like at Remo, when you start, hey, by the way, whatever device you have, go ahead, bring whatever you feel comfortable using. Here's a stipend. And then on day one, you're completely onboarded into Intune. You have your cloud PC environment. If you so choose to want a Windows 365 environment, uh, you'll have access to your applications, your Microsoft 365 subscription. Like it is a ridiculously painless process compared to what I remember from my first job 20 years ago. Like it's just, it's I think and night. the way you described it is uh, advanced and still quite uncommon. Uh, okay. Okay. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that uh, X percentage, let's call it five to seven or 10% of companies. I really think you have created a unique experience with that. I still think that it's, it is a, it's going to be easier to do this for what we call greenfield companies, which I, I don't know like too us. much about. Startup. Yeah, like yeah. you. Okay, great. Yeah. You know, right, you stood up, you have company, you don't have any on-prem stuff that you have to worry about too much. It's going to be easier at your size and scale and so on. Yeah. You take, you know, you take insurance company ABC or financial company, you know, DEF, you know, with all, with 30,000 computers, actually, that actually is, it's actually a hard problem to solve. So I said, Oh, why, why would that be? Because at this point now you've got different, you know, different people with different requirements, different needs. And it's just actually way, it, it, it actually is going to be much harder at scale to just say like, go to Best Buy and buy a thing. Um, and then 
<clears throat> you know, what happens w- when the person is terminated? Uh, do you, yeah, do you keep the machine as a parting gift from Don Pardo? Like, what do you do? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So, like, you know, you, you, these, these kinds of things, uh, are very, very, uh, you know, mature companies and so on. I think the, with legacy components, I think have a have a harder time. What I am seeing, of course, is this idea of autopilot, right? Autopilot. Oh, right. Let's let's sort of get let's get everybody sort of oriented to that. So, and this that's. That, that's one of the things I talk about in, in my other book right there. There you go. The MDM book. So group policy yeah, is fun, right? So mm-hmm. group policy is the, like the on-prem way and Intune and um, MDM and autopilot is sort of the, a, a more modern way. Um, what does this mean? It means like, you know, when everybody's seen the blue screens, the, the blue screens, I call them blue screens of life when they come out of the box and you click next, 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 not the blue screen of death. That's really bad. <laughs> That's a different one. That's a different one. <laughs> yeah. So the blue screens of life come up and you, you know, like, oh, you're doing English and this keyboard and so on. Well, it's a way for that computer to be pre-connected and have like a handshake agreement between you and your Azure tenant. And in the back end behind that is Intune. Okay. Yeah. So you log on or there's some magic way for it to know like, oh, this computer's actually Sally's, but let's not worry about that. So like, okay, this computer's Sally and you log on and Sally logs on and boom, it, she, she gets provision this laptop it just drop it, somebody at fedex drops it off at her at her front door she yeah. opens it up plugs it in says yes i'm sally and then it says please wait and it will in perfect world anyway will start downloading all the apps from you know from the internet uh which is really going backward to your intune land it knows it's sally it knows blah 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 yeah that's a perfect world i i know there are some companies that are using it successfully it, it, there are some hiccups. It's not a perfect system. Uh, if it gets trapped in the in the out of box experience uh, and what's the uh, the the, in, the final Intune pages, that's a bummer because then it's really hard. Right now, the problem is troubleshooting. Right? It's not about not a matter of it works great. If it's lubricated and it's just greased and works great, it's great. It's the, there is the there's a little chasm around like oh it's not working great and Sally's stuck and she, what the heck is she gonna do that that right. is a hard problem to solve, which means you gotta really get it completely greased up perfectly before you ship that thing over to Sally. Yep. Going backward to like sort of the olden days where there was the ghost factory in the basement preloaded and stuff, you were really sure. I mean, really reasonably sure that was gonna work. Yep. Um, there is there is sort of that gap. This modern modern gap of like is that thing going to work perfectly um so we have to be conscientious of that anyway that's that oh oh, oh then there's a middle ground actually i forgot there's actually a middle ground it has a new phrasing it's like uh it used to be called white glove i can't remember quite what the new phrasing is but the idea is that you could get your manufacturer to ship the laptop to uh the it the home base uh not not the not the end user but like the, the regional office Use that internet connection to like download and pre-install stuff because you know that there's good bandwidth there, and it'll pre-download your gigantic office and dog food maker and all these other big things. Yeah. And then the last, then it gets, then it gets put back in a FedEx box and shipped to Sally. And then the last mile, the last fifteen percent is over the internet there. So there is a middle ground there too. So there are people. I mean, the people are still doing that. I mean, the the number of endpoints under management, under management by these original equipment manufacturers like HP, Lenovo, and Dell that are being actually shipped to IT admins. Yeah. That that's a material business, by the way, right? Like, there's a lot of endpoints under management that way. And I think you're right. I think the the certainty as and it's really funny that you mentioned it, the Ghost Factory was almost a hundred percent certain when you were going to ship that box. Oh yeah. That, you that knew exactly worked. what was on there, right? And then as we get towards a more flexible model of delivery and onboarding, we're starting to see that there are some chinks in the armor, right? There mm-hmm. are some places that you could get stuck. Um, and we, we've experienced that as well, right? But from from my perspective, the, the more I think about it, the more I think that you know people's expectations as they start new roles, um, and, and you're right, some of the more mature organizations have that legacy technical debt where they can't necessarily have a super elegant day one onboarding um, because of the complexity of the applications, the fact that they're 20 years old, they're homegrown, they've been written for, you know, server 2000 and they're running in server 2000 yeah. somewhere. But I think that for, a, for for most end users, their expectations are this is going to be a, a pretty painless process to get onboarded. Well, assuming all that goes right and applications do get delivered, you know, uh, you know yeah. what I'm doing at PolicyPack is 
is the sec is like the second layer on top of that, right? Some yeah. applications, even though they're deployed, they still require local admin rights. If so Dogfree Maker throws a UAC prompt, what are you gonna do? Yep. Great. We can deliver the settings to overcome the UAC prompt. Like another example, you've got sometimes one, two, three, or four browsers. You can have Internet Explorer, it's not dead yet. You can have <laughs> Edge, you can have Chrome, you can have Firefox. Uh, and even when Edge, even when Internet Explorer does die, there's still going to be Internet Explorer in Edge mode, which yeah. will do all the things. Really, it does all the things. It does ActiveX. It does, uh, you know, all these, all, you know, the Internet Explorer modes. It does all those things. And you might have web browse. You might have these web apps that require, like your Time Card app, only freaking works in Internet Explorer. <laughs> right, right. And we can dictate which web app should go to what browser, even if that's mm. Internet Explorer in Edge mode or you're you know, dealing with your lunch menu system. That thing only works in Firefox. We can dictate the right browser for the right website. Um, and we can also bomb applications on the machine through our, uh, through a, you know, we have this thing called policy pack um, uh, application delivery with script, uh, with uh, uh, application delivery and also scripts where we can deliver stuff onto the machine if it's living on a Dropbox or a OneDrive or a Azure or whatever. We can bomb an application on and keep it updated for you. So you know, we, there's the, at a, that initial onboarding of a of a laptop with apps, and then keeping those apps up to date. That's something that people, of course, need to do. There's a myriad of ways to do that, but also yep. overcoming these application and browser challenges on Windows, um, you know, is something that. You know, if anybody's interested, we can certainly help with. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up, Jeremy, because so I know we're running close to, you know, the end of time here. But one thing I wanted to ask you is a little bit of a f philosophical question. Sure. Because uh, you and I have unique perspectives around applications and extending the life of an application, right? Mm. Um, I've only seen it once where uh, a CIO in 2012 made a decision at a very well-known consulting firm that they were getting rid of every desktop client-based application from, um, you know, tax. So, like, they rewrote a ticketing system in Vietnam. Everything became SaaS. Yeah. It, took, it, it took till now. It took $2 billion, but they've moved everything to that. From my perspective, that's yeah. not that's not reality for most people. That's no, just I haven't not heard of it yet. Gonna I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, uh, I can't remember. It might have been Brian Madden, industry luminary, uh, uh, now retired uh, from the industry, who said something like, it, "When nuclear war h h hits, you know, it's cockroaches that that it will survive. But when it comes to uh, something like when it comes to applications, it's Windows apps that will survive, yeah. right? So like Windows apps are the cockroaches uh, that will never go away. Could could you <laughs> could you can you can you stamp out every single one at an environment of a size that's thirty five or fifty or hundred? Maybe at that scale, mm -hmm. maybe at small scale. But when it comes to okay, a thousand, all right, ten thousand. I mean that's. Like I said, the data shows that like insurance company ABC with 11,000 apps, good luck. So if you yeah. want to spend $2 billion at it, uh, great, more power to you if you got a way to do it. I understand the value of doing that, but then, oh my gosh, you're maintaining all that code too, right? That's so, right. All right, so that now, you've, now you're in the software generation and care and feeding business, which is different than like click, click, next, 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 <laughs> that you know somebody might you know, be providing support for, or even if it's out of support, that might be okay as long as the thing works as advertised and you can, you know, use it. I feel bad for that par those paradox guys. I, I mean, that might be, maybe maybe there's a middle ground. If you're using something that's DOS-based, okay, yeah. maybe we can figure out a way to modernize that. But if it's actually real Windows and the company, like, I'm, again, I keep using Camtasia because it's just something that I use all the time. That's modern-ish. It runs, it's full fidelity, runs on Windows. I, I can't see the need to necessarily lift and shift that by rewriting every stick of code and putting it on. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're stu we're stewards of Windows application lifecycle, right? Like, I mean, you start thinking about the fact that you have the ability to, um, with Policy Pack, do some of the stuff that you know extends the lifecycle of this time card application that's running in you know IE versus us that are kind of testing some of these applications and saying, guess what? I know you're running on server two thousand eight R two right now, but I can get you to 2019 yeah. um, through the automated testing and figure that out, right? Like, so yeah, we can I, still I, extend the life cycle of that app. I would agree. I mean, at some point, I mean, uh, in in the history of the earth, that app will probably be upgraded or retired. I mean, things do get point. retired yeah. at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, but you know, for it, it depends on how it is. Everything is a price performance ratio effort. Uh, if you can get away with uh, having a plan for it, and that plan is I'm making it up a five year plan. Every application, you know, like I'm not saying every application should necessarily have this, but like take some that you, know, you want to have a five year plan for. That's fine. That in that case, you use the tools and tooling available to you, and eventually you, you do it. To, to do everything like the way you described yeah. uh, for $2 billion. That sounds like overkill for now. Eventually those applications are going to fall off and be replaced by useful things. But uh, look, we got to make do with the tools we have, the amount of people we have on a project. Uh, it sounds great if you could do it, but it's not really realistic. Yeah. I mean, resourcing, that's, that's the toughest thing. Like in every industry right now, whether it's hospitality, whether it's it, um, you know, the, the, the shortage of labor is just a shocking thing. So whenever we can start thinking about extending and doing cost savings or extending the life cycle of something mm -hmm. or making it more purposeful or even just like automation in general, Jeremy, like this is, I, I'm, I'm going to be doing the, the, the Danish uh, user group uh, keynote in May. And my topic of conversation is going to be really focused on the fact that you want, you have to make do with the tooling that you have, right? But it's never too late to invest in automation, right? Like just in general, if you can take legacy IT operations, testing applications, testing patches, wor worrying about the life cycle, the extension of the life of an application, and you can leverage automation so that the resources can focus on innovation, like the people, the human capital, it, it, like that's it. That, you were that, singing that, my song. I, I just, I just had a tweet about this. Not to say that Twitter is like the best place for everything, but yeah. uh, I was basically somebody was like, you know, how should I be thinking about my priorities? And uh, you know, and I basically said like, fix everything that's broken first, okay? Um, automate the crap out of everything second, mm -hmm. and then add value to your business third. Yeah. Okay, like that. It, it that's just my personal philosophy, right? And I think, oh, I remember what it was. I remember what it was. Somebody was saying, "Is it ethical? Was is it ethical for an IT professional to basically automate themselves out of a job?" And I'm like, "Hell, double yes." Yeah. Okay, is that ethical? <laughs> okay, right? Because uh, you know, you say, "Well, if I make my work into a click and then and, and I'm done, and I got five minutes of work to do a week, I want to pay you more." Yeah. <laughs> OK, because then I, I can have you focused on the big things like that mm -hmm. really expensive app that really should be converted over to SaaS or whatever it is like I can yeah. get you or uh, increasing my security posture or finding another thing to automate like the, where that maybe a second tier guy isn't as sophisticated as you. Hell double yes. OK, yeah. so fix everything that's broken first if it's going to be broken, automate the snot out of everything second. And then lastly, add value to your business in terms of like being able to bring in tacos third. That's, that's just my own philosophy. Well, that's the innovation, <laughs> right? That's 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 freeing somebody up. I mean, you're not working yourself into out of a job. You're working yourself into a bigger job, a, a more valuable role inside of the mm -hmm. organization if you're able to do that, right? If you're able to fix one and two, uh, you will automatically buy just by de facto standard be doing number three. Yeah. There you go. Cool. So, hey, Jeremy, we're up against the hour. So thank you so much for the time. The godfather of group policy himself taking the time to sit with the Remo team uh, and, and share pearls of wisdom. Uh, so every time we get a chance to talk, Jeremy, I always walk away with one or two new sayings. Um, now I've got my, hey, I didn't invent application management, but I did invent <laughs> the application management sandwich. So thank you for taking the time. Good. Um, any closing thoughts from your side? Uh, no. Uh I'm I'm not appearing or going anywhere interesting. <laughs> I just got back, like I said, from the um, from the EUC Masters retreat, which was really good. But I have nothing else to promote. But if anybody is interested in, like I said, after applications are on the box and need to be well managed, after that, boom! If you want to check out Policypack, come over to policypack.com or come over to Netrix, um, and you'll find the Policypack link there. And we'd love to have you just sign up for a webinar. Webinar gets you the ability to download the bits, and then we'll go to the ends of the earth to make it work for you. That's it. Love it. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thanks so much, Sage. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.
Thanks. Chat soon, guys. Remo3 offers automated pre-deployment testing of Windows applications, OS updates, and security patches. Use unattended automation to test and assess application readiness for Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows 365, Azure Virtual Desktop, as well as identifying MSIX and multi-session suitability. Your apps, your workspace, our priority.